A creepy lady attempts to lure in an unsuspecting victim. A blood-covered woman going insane. A man lurking inside a home. And a housemate suspected of being a serial killer. Headphones recommended. Listener discretion advised. Good evening and welcome back everyone. I'm your host Chad. This week, you're getting four true terrifying tales straight from Reddit that will chill you to the bone. So brace yourself. This is Disturbed. And we're back from our Thanksgiving break. I hope everyone had a safe and fun time with family. Tonight, our first experience teaches us that safety should overrule kindness. Performing this experience is our newest narrator, Nicole Doolin. I have always had an innate fear of the night. Not so much the dark, but the night itself. As a child, my imagination was overcome with stories of creatures that come alive at night, and the safety offered by a house and light. I never had anything to base this fear on, until a night when I decided to go with a buddy of mine to a baseball game, and got stuck at a light at 2am after dropping him off at home. Of course, that night the game went into extra innings, and so I didn't get a chance to drop my friend off back home until well after 1 a.m. Everything was fine on the way home until I hit a light right before the street that led to my house. It was a T-junction, and I was turning left. The light is one of those that you think is broken until it finally turns green, right when you finally decide to just run it. Of course, I pulled up right as the light turned red. I would have just run the light, seeing as no one was there and it was closing in on 2 a.m. on a school night. But earlier that week, I had heard the phrase, Character is what you do when no one is looking. And for whatever reason, that was the night I decided to prove to myself that I was a woman of character. Big mistake. I pulled to a stop at the light, feeling good about myself bordering on self-righteous, when I happened to look out my window to my left and noticed a lady sitting all alone on a bus bench. We made brief eye contact, and I quickly looked away. It was too late. I could see movement out of my peripheral vision and knew she was coming my way. I looked out the window and noticed she was carrying a bag. I quickly checked that my doors were locked and all my windows were up. I then moved my right foot above the accelerator just in case and braced myself for what was to come. I was hoping it would be just an awkward exchange and was praying for a quick light change before she reached me so I could just get out of there. I knew there was a slim chance of that. She walked right up to my window, put down her bag and began to tap on my window. I nervously looked up at her and she motioned for me to put my window down. I had automatic windows, so I just imagined pushing too hard on the window button and that thing just coming all the way down. So I took a deep breath and lightly flicked it with my finger. The window moved microscopically down, but she did not seem to notice or care. She then leaned in and began to talk. She said, My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? I should stop and give a brief physical description of the bag lady. She was small and skinny and of indeterminate age. She was either in her mid-twenties and had lived a hard twenty-plus years on the street, or she was a sixty-something-year-old who had lived a moderately hard life on the street. All that to say, just by looking at her, there was no way to verify her story. She looked beat up by life. 
not just by a boyfriend. But there was something about her delivery. It was robotic and seemed practiced and like she was disconnected from the moment. That made my skin crawl. And after a brief, about a second, debate on whether I should do it, I told her that I had to get home and could not give her a ride. After my first refusal, she leaned in closer and said the same thing again. My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? This time I felt more confident when I declined to give her a ride and told her I had a curfew and had to get home. She leaned in a third time and began her statement again. My boyfriend beat me. At this point, the light changed. I slowly lifted my foot off the brake and started slowly rolling forward and began muttering an apology. She didn't move. She just looked at the light, then looked down at me, leaned in closer and said five words that have haunted me ever since. You made the right decision. Then she picked up her bag and walked back towards the bench. I peeled out of the intersection and cried and screamed all the way home. I have no idea what she planned to do. Or if there were people waiting to jump in my car from the bushes had I moved to let her in. But that encounter has haunted me ever since. And has confirmed in my mind that nothing good happens after dark. Now, let's check in with our newest Patreon fan club members. Rye, Lisa, Deanna Hernandez, Cassandra Sturgeon, Megan Fields, and Atana O'Neill. Thanks everyone for supporting the show. All of them are now enjoying an ad-free listening experience, early access, and our bonus series of Disturbing Calls. Five bonus episodes are available to binge right now. If you're curious what else is included for Patreon members, or you want those bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast to start receiving your benefits today. Again, that's patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast, or find the link at the bottom of the show notes. Imagine, your doorbell rings. You look outside and see a woman, hysterical, covered in blood. That was the scenario facing Reddit user Reverserer. Performing this experience is Sarah Thomas. And just a warning, this story contains a fair amount of explicit language. Some random Tuesday in October. Sleeping soundly on my couch, I am awakened by a loud banging and screaming. Not just drunk people at 3 a.m. screaming, but that horrified, panic-filled, someone-is-fucking-dying screaming. You know it if you've ever heard it. My eyes pop open and I immediately see a half-naked woman covered in blood banging on my door. Ripped button-down shirt, barely holding on, boobies flapping everywhere, and panties. That's it. It's freaking October and New England. It's cold as shit here. Anyway, she is banging on my door with both fists, screaming, Help me! Help me! They are chasing me! They are going to get me! They are going to kill me! Help me! For the most part, I'm dumb. But not completely. I'm not going to just open my door to some screaming, bloodied-up psycho... I hit my alarm and let it go off a bit, perhaps scare off whoever is chasing her. Then I do the only humane thing I can do in this situation. I let her in. I pull her into my home and close the door really quickly. Answer the call from my alarm company. Yes, send the police. Send an ambulance. Thank you for being real. I've never used my alarm before, so it was nice to know they were actually real. Now I have this lady bleeding all over my living room and crying hysterically, 
repeating over and over, they were animals, they were chasing me like animals. I can clearly hear she has an accent. I'm figuring Russian, Romanian? She is speaking broken English and is scared as hell. I take her into the kitchen and enter CSI mode. I'm thinking, yeah, I got this shit. I'm gonna not contaminate evidence and make sure I keep all the bloody drags I used to clean her up for the cops. All the while, she is still saying she was being chased by animals and all that. She is fucked up. The side of her face is scratched up. Her arms are scraped. Her legs are all bloody with scrapes like she took a good fall. Just fucked up and bloody everywhere. So, scene setter. 3.30 a.m. Kitchen. Bloody, half-naked, not-good, English-speaking, hysterical, fucked-up, bloody woman. Me, collecting evidence. Me. It's okay. Calm down. The police are on their way with an ambulance. Psycho. They were chasing me like animals. Me. You're safe now. Let's get you cleaned up. Psycho. They were chasing me like animals. They were going to get me. Psycho. They were chasing me. Then they turned into werewolves. Me. Thinking. Oh, fuck me. Psycho. They were chasing me and turned into werewolves in my eyes. Me. Now I'm scared. Calm down. You're safe here. I bring her back into the living room and I'm fucking scared. Many, many thoughts run through my head now. Am I going to die tonight? Is she going to attack me? Why aren't the fucking police here yet? I need a weapon and fast. But mostly just OMG, 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 what the fuck, OMG, what the fuck, OMG, what the fuck, fucking psycho, oh my gosh, what the fuck? She is bandaged but still rambling on and on about animals and chasing her and what have you. I decide it's probably a good idea to give 911 another call, Z, just to be sure they know my address. It also allows me to get my couch in between me and her, affording me a little bit of safety. Not much, but I was confident in my run-around-the-couch-she'll-never-catch-me skills. She is pacing my living room, rambling, when she goes over to the window and starts staring. A good... 10 second stare with a creepy silence attached to it then babies there are babies in the road oh my god look at all the babies in the road screaming at the top of her lungs i'm not coming out from behind the couch let the babies in the road die this goes on for a good 30 seconds not an imaginary 30 seconds where you think it's been like five minutes and it's really only been like 10 seconds this was a full-on 30 seconds of screaming and me standing behind my couch thinking, Fuck you, I'm not falling for that trick. Finally, the police come. The officer knocks on my door. I now have to leave the safety of the backside of my couch to unlock the door. I dash. Fucking Christ, that's right. I dashed my ass to that door and ran out and told the cop, She's fucking nuts. Be careful. They take her to the ambulance and do whatever they need to do to her. I'm chilling on my couch, shell-shocked. I mean, what the fuck? The cop comes back and asks me if I know her. She looks familiar, but I don't know her. Then he asks me if I was babysitting for her. I'm like, huh? No, no, I'm not babysitting for her. The cop proceeds to say, oh, because she said you were babysitting her kids and when she showed up to collect them, you wouldn't give them back. At this point, I'm exhausted and frog-eyed and throw my rights out the window and tell the cop to search my house that there are no kids here. The cop knows it's a BS story she gave, but he had to ask anyhow. I understand that. He doesn't search my house. Ambulance takes her away. Cops leave. It's now 4 a.m. and I'm sitting on my couch knowing I'm never going to get back to sleep and the workday is going to suck. The best part of the story is what the police blotter said in the next day's paper. Resident lets woman claiming to be chased by werewolves into her home. Awesome. Just awesome. Turns out, I did know her. She was my neighbor. Yeah, great fucking neighbor I am. I arrive home from my suck-ass day to find DCF, Department of Children and Families, waiting outside my door. Come on. Really? I now have to let her into my home because I, 
being the nosy fuck that I am, want to know what the deal is with Psycho Woman. Contrary to what the police blotter said, I usually don't let people, <laughs> sorry, people claiming to be chased by werewolves, into my home. I was willing to make the exception for the police the prior night because I was scared as hell and shit. Fear can quickly remove quite a few boundaries. Anyhow, DCF woman informs me that Psycho Woman was my neighbor. I knew she looked familiar, but I just couldn't place her face. Perhaps the blood and scrapes and psychotic behavior threw me off. There seems to be a missing child, or so Psycho Woman told them at the hospital. I'm starting to get a little freaked out as Psycho Woman already accused me of not giving back her, what we thought, imaginary kids. The story I got from DCF was limited. She wouldn't divulge much information, but in a nutshell, what I did manage to get is this. Psycho Woman lives next door to me, the house to my right. We share a fucking driveway. The house is a duplex, so people are always coming and going. I never paid much attention to anyone living there. Psycho Woman claims she has a child, a little girl, age unknown. Really? Although, after the prior night, why am I surprised that she didn't know the age of her kid? Said child is missing. Psycho Woman was under the influence of mind-altering drugs, you think? She was Romanian. That's it. The messed up thing is that I do remember seeing a child over there. A little girl, probably about four. I've only ever seen her one time. Maybe twice in the three years Psycho Woman has lived there. Again, never paid too much attention to what went on over there. DCF questions me about everything, from have I seen this lady before, to why would Psycho Lady choose my door to bang on? I'm not especially paranoid, but I can recognize the potential for a situation to turn ugly very quickly. I tell DCF Lady that I have no clue who the fuck this woman is, why she would choose to bang on my door, or where the fuck this psycho woman's alleged kid is. Pretty much exactly like that. Less the F-bombs. DCF Lady ensures me that they don't think I'm involved, that it is routine for them to follow up with me. DCF Lady leaves. I'm pretending like I don't want anything to do with this situation, but honestly, my life is boring. This is the most excitement I've had in months. Next day, four police cars, canine squad, five to six uniformed cops, and two plainclothes show up at my neighbor's house. My nosy ass goes outside. Psycho Woman's door is wide open, and the fuzz is walking in and out, and the canine unit is bringing in the dogs. The cop tells me the following story. I swear on all that is sacred, I am not making this shit up. It seems that upon entering the house, they found a fucking mess. Just dirty, dingy, an all-around health hazard. The basement was wall-to-wall -wall mattresses. The bathroom attached to the basement room was fucking rank. Cops' exact words. It was a two-bedroom condo with the non-master bedroom wall-to-wall -wall mattresses. However, the master bedroom looked like a king's room. Again, words used by the cop. That's pretty much all I got out of the cops. I hung around and watched them drag all the mattresses out. It was pretty fucking gross. Dirty piss stains and whatever else nastiness all over them. They took out about three dressers, cheap Walmart types, miscellaneous other crap, table, chairs, couch, etc. Turns out, this house is a Romanian immigrant sex trafficking operation. The owner of the house is bringing these Romanian girls over, providing housing, if you can call that housing, and selling them out for sex. Psycho Woman did have a kid, but it was taken away by DCF about six months prior. The psycho woman herself was, as far as they could tell, on a job using what they think was crack or meth. She freaked out all the fucked up, think Farrah Fawcett style, and was running home when she must have fallen, several times, and got all fucked up. She, again, what they think, hit the height of her paranoia upon reaching my door, and then, well, the rest is history. Moral of the story? If you don't let crazy, bloodied, half-naked women into your home at 3.30 a.m., you will never find out that your neighbors are running a Romanian immigrant sex trafficking operation.
Picture this. You call home to leave a voicemail for your mom, but the call is unexpectedly answered by a strange man, and he's inside your home. An anonymous Reddit user had to come to terms with exactly that. Performing this experience is Nicole Goodnight. Back in 2007, shortly after my 15th birthday, my mom was out of town for a few days on a business trip. My mom and I lived alone in a small house in a neighborhood that was on the sketchier end of decent, and, well, that fact combined with her paranoia about me being home alone longer than four or five hours meant that I had to stay over at a friend's house while she was gone. This friend's house was across the street and over one house from my own. The place my mom was going was only about two hours away, and I had gotten a bug up my ass about being treated like the young woman that everyone kept calling me, so for the week leading up to the trip, I was moaning and groaning about being old enough to take care of myself and insisting that I could just check in with my friend's parents every now and then. But in truth, my house was pretty creepy at night, even when my mom was there with me, and I found out the day my mom was scheduled to leave that my friend had somehow gotten her hands on a PlayStation 3, so it didn't take me too long to get over being unfairly babysat. At around 11 on the last night I was there, we ended up back in my friend's room screwing around with the brand new flip phone I had gotten for my birthday. Her parents had gone out hours earlier after buying us a pizza for dinner and probably weren't going to be back for at least an hour. And we'd gotten bored downstairs with her one PS3 game that we've been playing for days already. Turns out she had the PlayStation, but didn't have any money to actually buy games for it. That's how it usually goes, though, huh? It was too late to call any of our friends, but I knew my mom was coming home tomorrow morning at some ungodly hour, and I knew that she had this thing about our answering machine. No matter how tired she was... No matter where she'd gotten back from, if there were any messages on the answering machine, she'd listen to all of them. Being the bored 15-year-olds we were, my friend and I decided to leave a message or two for my mom to find in the morning. We called my home phone and put it on speaker, cracking up and trying to figure out what our message was going to be about. It normally took five rings for a call to go to the machine, but on the third ring, the phone picks up and we hear, Hello. The voice sounded like it belonged to some 60-year-old guy who'd been smoking for the last 40 years of his life, but even past that, there was this menace to his voice. I can't describe it exactly, but it sounded very cold and very dangerous. The sort of voice where, if you heard it on the street, you'd want to get away from the person immediately. I looked at my friend. Her eyes were huge and her face was completely pale, and I'm sure I didn't look any better. Neither of us could get it together to say anything in response. Hello, he said again. There was a pause and I tried to squeak out something along the lines of, Who the hell are you and why are you in my house? But then he said in a very low voice, You shouldn't have called. There was some sort of slam and the call disconnected. I immediately dropped my phone and proceeded to freak the fuck out, as did my friend. She asked me if I knew who that was, and I said no, of course I didn't know the creepy-ass guy answering my phone at 11 at night. We checked the call log to see if we'd accidentally called the wrong number. Nope. Right number. We were so shaken up that we couldn't immediately figure out who we should call or what we should do. If we should call the cops, or call my mom, or call my friend's parents, or run around making sure all the doors and windows were locked, or what. So we ended up sprinting around my friend's house, double-checking every lock we could check while gasping out what happened to my friend's parents on the phone. They were about 15 minutes away and said they'd call 911, and her mother told us to stay in my friend's room with the door locked and all the lights on in case this guy was going from house to house. And so for 10 minutes, we were huddled in the far corner of my friend's room, basically under her bed, jumping every time the house settled or one of our legs scraped on the carpet. You can imagine how freaked out we were when her parents rushed in and started rattling at her bedroom door, forgetting that it was locked on their orders. The cops got to my house not too long after her parents got home. To be honest, I don't really remember a lot of the specifics about what the cops were doing, mainly because I refused to set foot outside of the house, but I remembered that they asked my friend and I a lot of questions. We couldn't really give them a lot of information, unfortunately. We called from my friend's room, which was in the back of her house, away from where we would have been able to see my house, and dude with a creepy smoker's voice isn't a very helpful description to go off of when looking for someone. One question they asked sticks out, though. 
because I remember thinking it was weird for them to ask who had keys to get into the house. I told them only my mom and I had keys. I found out later that the reason the police asked that was because there were no signs of forced entry anywhere around the house and that the front door was wide open when they got there. There wasn't really anything messed up and, and nothing was taken, but our wall-mounted corded phone was hanging off the hook and the phone base itself was cracked, like it had been smashed with something. Both my mom's room and my room also had some stuff moved around and displaced, like someone was going through our drawers and the stuff in our rooms. My mom got called at some point during all of this and managed to get home that night, very tired and very freaked out about what had happened. The cops investigated the incident but never came up with any answers. We weren't doing too well financially at that point, but we still managed to move across town within a few months of this happening. For all the months between that night and the day we moved, though, I slept like shit and had really bad nightmares. I also flat out refused to be alone in the house, even for a couple of minutes, and started getting really obsessive about checking and double-checking the locks, a habit which has stuck around ever since this happened. And now that I've written all this out, I remember that there's one thing I haven't told anyone about all this, mostly because at the time I thought that the whole thing might get blamed on me if I said anything. Earlier that day, I'd gone back over to my house to get a notebook of mine full of writing I wanted to show my friend. Nothing was obviously wrong as far as I could tell. The front door was locked when I got to it. No signs of any tampering with it or, or any weirdness by the door. No noises from any part of the house, but the minute I stepped inside, something just felt off. Really off. It was really, really quiet. I was getting chills all up and down my spine and I had goosebumps all over. I tried to will myself to just get over it, to go back to my room to get the notebook, but... I couldn't make myself take more than a few steps into the house. I was too creeped out. I locked the door and ran back across the street. When I got back to my friend's house, I felt like an idiot, of course. Was I really such a wimp that I couldn't walk through my own house when it was empty? But looking back? Well, who knows? Maybe my gut was right about something just not being right. Freaks me out even thinking about what could have happened if I had ignored it and walked further inside. I've thought back on that moment a lot, too wondering if maybe I left the door open when I left, but there's no way. I distinctly remember locking the deadbolt and looking over my shoulders the whole time because I had that burning, crawling feeling on the back of my neck you get when you're being watched, and after the creepy call, I checked and I had my keys in my backpack. Also, a few people have asked why he picked up the phone. I have no idea, honestly. My mom and I have tried to figure out why the hell he would do that, but we haven't come up with a good answer in seven years. Same with how he got inside in the first place without having a key and without forcing or breaking something open. My guess is that there was another way inside the house that we never knew about and that the police didn't find that he somehow figured out, which implies a lot of bad things. In any case, I never found out, and it would be really strange to go back and ask the current owners if I could randomly poke around their house and foundation, and, and besides that, I can't go back into that neighborhood without getting the chills, so it's probably going to remain a mystery. And thanks to everyone who's been saying they're glad that I got out all right. I am too. Like you wouldn't believe. So random home intruder with a creepy voice and a very mysterious, probably fucked up motive for breaking into my house? Let's not meet ever, ever again. And here we are, at the tail end of this week's episode. But we're not done yet. After the break, you'll hear one of the craziest stories we've ever had. So stick around. This episode of Disturbed was made possible by The Gallery. This year, we're all looking for that perfect holiday gift. And today, I want to tell you about The Gallery. The Gallery Shop is a curated collection of photographs from all around the world. All prints are made from 100% recycled aluminum, giving your wall that gallery finish. Right now, for the holiday season, The Gallery is exclusively offering disturbed listeners 25% off your next purchase. Using the code FRIDAY, that's 25% off your next purchase at thegallery.com. That's the gallery, G A L R Y dot com, using code Friday. The gallery, create your perfect space. 
And with that, we've reached our final experience. It's not uncommon to have a roommate who does some things you don't like. But what if you suspected him of being a serial killer? Reddit user Logan Ock had to live with just that. Performing this experience is Tom Aglio. This is a convoluted story, so bear with me as I try to convey everything I can recall about what led to the conclusion that my ex-housemate could have potentially been a serial killer, or serial killer in the making. It was the summer of 2015 when I moved in, and at first appearances, my housemate-slash-landlord Mike was somewhat normal, if not a bit socially awkward and dysfunctional. When I was signing the papers, he was adamant that I should never go into the basement, which I thought was odd, but I really needed a place to stay, and, well, people have their little quirks, so I just chalked it up to that at the time. As I got to know Mike and our cohabitation continued, I learned more about the depths of his dysfunction. Firstly, that he used meth. Now, I don't automatically judge people based on vices, but I was surprised at the extent of his use. He was probably the first person I knew who used meth and balanced a full-time job, enjoyed a decent amount of success. The reason this is important to the story is that when he would be around the house drinking and using meth, he would start to run off at the mouth. He would often joke that if I smelled lye coming from the basement, not to think anything of it. I think it was probably the third time he said this that I asked why he keeps saying that. And he said, I use chemicals to clean up after the bodies, with a wily grin on his face. I tried to chalk that up to a bad sense of humor, but it didn't sit right with me. He was also very particular that I let him know of my coming and going and my work schedule. I remember him being shocked and uncomfortable one day that I ended up taking off of work because he didn't realize that I was home. I remember that day because there was a lot of clanging and what sounded like muffled shouting coming from the basement. His car was in the driveway, but he was not in the main house or his bedroom. Other days, he would play very loud music that bumped through the whole house. Sometimes he would even play NPR talk radio at those volumes. In retrospect, I think he may have been trying to mask sounds. He would make remarks about sex workers, saying you can do whatever you want, you can choke them or beat them to death and nobody cares. I took exception to this. I told him I thought that was messed up. But when he would get tweaking, he'd always come back around to alluding to the same kind of violence, talking about how he was a normal white guy who owned a house and had a good career, so the police would never suspect him. At this point, I start to think that it has gone too far to simply be a joke. I was in a weird position because money was tight at the time, and my options were few. I tried to convince myself that even if he is messed up, he's probably just engaging in outward fantasism. I knew that he would acquire the services of sex workers on occasion, but again, did not judge that activity at face value, but started becoming concerned. Then at one point I was doing laundry, I caught whiffs of decomposition. The house we were in was in southeast Portland. It was relatively new. Having grown up in upstate New York, I know that animals can be trapped in walls and die, but this was the garage, and there were no animals scurrying in the walls. This was strange and telling to me. I considered carefully what I would do and decided I would confront him about the smell. I decided to poise the question in a somewhat suggestive way by expanding on his jokes. I told him he needs to do a better job cleaning up the bodies because I smelled decomposition from the garage. I will never forget his reaction. His eyes widened and he shot me a sharp glare. Somewhere between fear and anger, he stumbled over his words and eventually responded, What? Really? I said, Yes, really. And there was a few seconds of awkwardness before he said, Thanks for letting me know, and promptly went into his bedroom and shut the door. A few days after that, he went into the upper crawl space in the garage, while I was again doing laundry. He called for me and was trying to convince me to come up into the crawl space. My body locked up and it was like my instincts were screaming at me that if I went up there, I would not come back down. I gave some excuse that I can sparsely remember that I had to be someplace, packed up my laundry, threw it in my room, and left. He spent a lot of time in the padlock basement without a doorknob. The only way in was through the backyard. I wish I would have gone down there in retrospect to either confirm or dismiss the suspicions once and for all. In the last couple months I had lived there, I was privy to more graphic comments about women and sex workers, explicit talk of sexual violence, and he was using more and more. 
he once showed me a video he made, he is a graphic designer and artist as well, which featured heavy bondage themes interspersed with distorted audio of women screaming and this strange leering figure in a plague doctor costume. It was one of those situations where any one of these things alone may be innocuous, but as they accumulated, it became suspicious to me. It was October of 2016 that I left there, taking off to Osete Oyate camp during the anti-pipeline protests with Standing Rock Lakota. A mix of feeling called to action and having nothing to lose as I wanted to get out of that house in the worst way. My last night there, I did not give notice that I was leaving, he was drinking and tweaking again. Started in on the same conversation loosely describing murder and sexual violence in the tone of some sort of edgy joke. I told him he would be caught eventually, not even holding back my suspicion anymore. He reiterated that he was the last person police would suspect, and asserted that they wouldn't catch him. He said this in a very serious and concise way, dropping the pretense he had been using before. I left the next morning. This haunted me for months, then a year, then a year and a half. I felt as though I hadn't done anything. The guilt was eating away at me, so I called Portland Crime Stoppers and put in an anonymous tip describing what I had described here. When I did, the operator started going back and forth putting me on hold because the call had piqued the interest of the police sergeant who was assigned to the call center. So they were asking me detailed questions about his vehicle, his house, the methods he described, etc. It seemed like they took interest. I gave them as much information as I could remember and left it at that, feeling just a little bit better that I had at least tried to do something about it. Fast forward to recent times, I told my mother about all of this, and she became interested, asking what house this was, and she ended up pulling it up on GMAPS. She put up the street view and I noticed there was a large enclosed trailer in the driveway that wasn't there when I was. I could theorize why it might have been there, but cannot put together a practical reason for it, or why he'd be using it, unless he was moving or using it to haul things to discard. Admittedly, that is pure conjecture, but I couldn't help but wonder. I doubt that I will get closure, or have my suspicions validated unless he does finally get caught and arrested, and I read about it. I have grown up poor and been around the lowlife a lot. I have interacted with many sketchy and unsavory people in my time, but none of them have ever made the impression that Mike made on me. Make of it what you will, but I hope I never meet him again. Before we check out this week, I want to leave you with a voicemail from a listener in Columbus, Georgia. Hey, Chad. Um, I'm just a listener. Just calling in, letting you know I'm from Columbus, Georgia, and me and my girlfriend listen to you every week when you come out with a new episode. Um, I'm an exterminator, so I'm driving around town all day, always looking for good podcasts to listen to, and honestly, you have one of the best. So just keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words, and I love hearing from you guys. You can always leave a voicemail or text us at 701-354-3667. Let me know what's on your mind. Again, 701-354-3667. This episode of Disturbed was mixed and produced by yours truly. And that electrifying, spine-tingling score you heard is courtesy of White Bat Audio, Co.ag, and Kevin Hartnell. Special thanks to all the contributing narrators and submitters of these stories. You'll find all the relevant links in the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all. <laughs>